We are uh, going this morning to Matthew chapter 2, as was shared in our Advent uh, recognition, uh, we are focusing in on the uh, Magi or the wise men. Uh, These individuals traveled a great distance, following, the scriptures tell us, a star, traveled about a thousand miles. Uh, The journey itself probably took uh, somewhere in about two to three months. And usually when we uh, see the account of this uh, at Christmas uh, on television or in one of the movies, uh, we generally see just uh, three wise men that come and uh, maybe a small entourage with them. But you have to remember the day and the age in which they were traveling. It was not a, a time that was conducive to going far distances without coming across some form of difficulty. The roads were filled with bandits and robbers. And so these were very important individuals, very mighty individuals, uh, held in high esteem by those around them. And so they were just right for picking. And we see from, uh, from the Scripture in Matthew chapter 2, they were carrying with them treasures. And this is, of course, something that the bandits and the robbers, they were really keeping their eye out for. So these were people that were not traveling just by themselves or just with a small entourage. It has been estimated by some that this group probably traveled with a caravan of about 300 people. Not only were they the Magi traveling, but uh, also you had their servants and you more than likely had uh, soldiers that were stationed with them to deter any form of robbery that might take place. So here was this large group of individuals who have picked up, packed up, and have gone because they saw within the sky a star. And through their research, through their studying of all the different nations around them, they have pinpointed that there is one that proclaimed something that was going to happen in its history that perhaps this star had something to do with. And that nation was Israel. And so they follow, the scriptures tell us, the star. And they come to the city, these distinguished men, and they tell the population, we are looking for a child. We are looking for someone who is to be born the king of the Jews. Now there's an important question that needs to be answered. Remember that this event took place about two years after the birth of Christ. We feel this is so because uh, when Herod later on uh, goes to have all the children killed because he feels that this king of the Jews is a threat to his throne, he instructs his soldiers to look for all these children, all these male children that are two years and under. And also the scriptures tell us in Matthew that uh, when they come, he is referred to as a child, not an infant, a child. And he is in a home, no longer in the stable. And so where most of the time we see in the accounts of these wise men following on the heels of the shepherds who come to see this child, chances are that was not the case. And so they're coming at a later time. Now, again, the question that we need to answer is, why did these wise men, why did these magi go to Jerusalem? Why did they go to that city? Now, most would say, and and women especially would say, these were not typical men. Because men never stopped and asked for directions, right? Right? Yet, most of us look at this and say, well, that's exactly why they're in Jerusalem. They stop and ask for directions. Following the star. We're wondering where this child born king of the Jews is. And most of our contemplation is that uh, they ask in Jerusalem because it's the capital city, so uh, the king of the Jews must be in Jerusalem. But many believe that it goes a little bit deeper than that. True, 
It appears they are, and they do ask for questions. In, in Matthew 2, 2, chapter 2, verse 2, it's saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And then you go down to verse 9 of Matthew 2, and it says, After listening to the king, the king Herod, he says, When you find this child, uh, tell me where he's at, and I want to go worship him too. But after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. The star had been leading them, correct? Now, if that's the case, wouldn't the star had initially led them to Bethlehem in the first place? Why did they have to stop in Jerusalem to ask for directions? when they had been following the star all this time. And even after they go to Jerusalem, the star continues to lead them to the city of Bethlehem, where they do eventually find the child. And so again, there's this hanging question there. Why did they go to Jerusalem? If the star initially led them to that exact spot where Jesus was, And the answer is very simple. God wanted them to go to Jerusalem. It was in God's plans that this would happen. Not to have them bypass Jerusalem and go straight to Bethlehem, but God had a purpose for them to stop in the city. You know, you think about it. Who made the star? God did. Who was guiding that star? God was. And so God was in control of everything that was going on surrounding the birth of Jesus. And so God very easily could have led them around Jerusalem, knowing that there's danger there, led them around straight to Bethlehem, but God wanted them specifically to stop in that city. And the reason... Again, why they needed to be there is that God had this purpose. Up until this time, Jerusalem has been kept out of the loop. Uh, For one and a half, two years since the birth of this child, everything seems to be taking place outside of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, there's no one really that, uh, that goes into the city. Ah, but there is. What about the shepherds? You remember those shepherds in Luke chapter 2 that the angels appeared before and pronounced the birth of this child, the Savior who is Christ the Lord? And it says after the shepherds depart, the shepherds go, see that the angels, what they had said was true. After they depart from the scene, they're going out and they're proclaiming to everyone they come into contact with. Now, the shepherds, they're about five miles outside of Jerusalem. And I have no doubt these men who were raising these sheep, and the main purpose for raising the sheep was that they could be utilized in the sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. They start coming into Jerusalem, again, in through the shepherd's gate with all these sheep, and they start to tell people about what they had seen, what they had heard, the message that they had received. They start to to communicate to those that they come into contact with about this Savior. And so God did send someone. He didn't send the angels into Jerusalem. Could have done that. He sent these shepherds into the capital. Now Jerusalem, of course, it's the seat of power. That's where the king was. It's where the priests are. It's where the scribes and the Pharisees, all the political leaders, all the religious leaders are in the city of Jerusalem. And they start to hear rumors that have been coming from these shepherds about this Savior. And what are the political leaders? What do the religious leaders do? Well, basically, they do what they did when Jesus grew up and entered into the city. They start to laugh. They start to scoff. 
Here are these shepherds, these commoners, these unclean individuals coming to them and telling them angels appeared to us and told us a Savior was born. Well, why in the world would they come to you when they had us? Why wouldn't they come to the king? Why wouldn't they come to the religious leaders and declare a Savior? Why would they come to you commoners? And so the shepherds, I'm sure, just as they were proclaiming this news, were laughed out of town. They scoffed them, made fun of them for who they were and what they were trying to proclaim. And people as general, not only had they turned their backs on the shepherds at that point, but continued to do so. You know, God could have gone to the king. God could have gone to the religious leaders. But he went to these shepherds. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Very true throughout what God does in this world. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God show, chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. That's the way God works. That's how God does things. That's how God has always done it. For centuries, the church, God's people, have had a hard time coming to terms with this. We think we need something more, something special, in order to draw attention to God, in order to draw attention to a Savior. And we've done our best in all sorts of ways in order to do this. You know, if we had had our way, we'd have done exactly that, you know, I'd have sent these angels to the king. I'd have sent messengers to the religious leaders. That's how you sell it. That's how you promote it. That's, if you really want a Savior to be proclaimed to this world, you would push him towards them. You know, I don't know who was on the advertising team uh, up in heaven that organized all this, but they certainly wouldn't have done it the way the world does it. God chooses to do it differently. He chooses what we consider a foolish way of doing it. And that's the way we've done things for centuries as a church. We have the big promotion. We do big things in order to garner the world's attention. You, you remember Robert Schuller out in California, in Los Angeles, built the Crystal Cathedral. Started out in his ministry standing on the top of a, the roof of a concession stand at a drive-in theater preaching to people that would drive up in their cars and they would park around him and he'd get up on the concession stand and he'd start preaching to the people. And that's how his ministry began. And this was the result of the ministry. Actually, I didn't know it until I did some looking into this, but, but the Crystal Cathedral was built on the site of that drive-in theater. In fact, they continued throughout the history of this church to... Uh, to allow cars to come and to park in the parking lot surrounding the church itself and people to remain in their cars and to listen to it over their radio. That's how many people went to church. But you look at that structure, you see how massive it is. And certainly, it was built that way for a purpose. It would draw people's attention. They're, they're thinking, of course, is let's, let's get everybody in. Let's get them to church. Let's impress them with the bigger, the better building and the programs. And it works for a while. But after a while, something usually happens. May not have heard it, but Crystal Cathedral, that ministry has gone bankrupt. They had to sell that building. It's no longer the church that Robert Schuller started. Now, this isn't something new. We've, we've been doing this for centuries. You know, they have built monasteries. They have built cathedrals around the world. You can still see them. Uh, one of the most prominent is in, it's in Washington, D.C. And, and you go all over in Europe and you see these these buildings and you walk into them and they're so elaborate they're so big they draw attention 
But most of them you walk in today and you can hear your footsteps echoing throughout the building and you go in in their times of worship and there are so few seats that are filled. What started out as something to impress usually kind of died down after a while. It's always been like that. But that's our way of doing it. And our way of pronouncing the Savior to the world by making a big production out of it, would it have worked? Would that have been a success? No. It's not the way God does it. God does it differently. It's not how God builds His church. You see, God was more impressed with shepherds in the field than He was the religious leaders in that big, impressive temple that King Herod had constructed. With all its elaborate architecture, all its gold, all its cedar, God chose these shepherds in order to get the message out. What was the message? What did God want the people to know? Jesus. Wanted to know that His Son came into the world. The church gets so wrapped up in trying to impress that we forget that message. We forget what Christmas is really all about. Even as we try to do things during the Christmas season. We try to make it bigger and we try to make it bigger, better so many times and we forget what it is we're trying to communicate. And God very simply just tried to let the world know that He was sending His Son. Now, again, God's way of doing things isn't about impressing people. It's why He didn't send the angels into Jerusalem. But if He didn't send the angels, why did He send the wise men? Again, they could have bypassed that. It seems like it's kind of contradictory. He wouldn't send the angels to the big and the powerful in order to announce the Savior. He used those shepherds in the field. But then all of a sudden, He changes course. He, he changes His strategy, it would seem. And He sends these wise men, these magi into the capital city. Well, there's, there's really kind of a difference in responses. And it was a difference that would be seen throughout the ministry of Jesus. It's a difference that is seen even today. See, the angels, they go to the shepherds. And what do the shepherds do? They go out and they tell everyone they come into contact with about this child. About what the angels proclaim to them. The angels told us, a Savior has been born. He's Christ the Lord. He's in the city of David. Let's go. Let's go see this child. And they go and they, as they're leaving, they're proclaiming to everyone they come into contact with about what they had seen, what they had heard, the message that they had received. That was the response of the shepherds. Now you go to Matthew chapter 2 and the wise men, they go to Jerusalem. God sends them there. And they go. And everybody hears what the wise men say. And the wise men all say, did you hear what they said? A Savior has been born. Let's go with them to, to Bethlehem and let's go worship this Savior. Is that what everybody in Jerusalem said? The wise men come, they say, we're looking for the king of the Jews. And they hear from the, the religious leaders about the prophecies, and then they go off. And, and Herod comes to them, the political power in Jerusalem, Herod comes to them and says, okay, when you find that child, come back to me. Tell me where he's at, and I'll go worship them. And the wise men who came by themselves into Jerusalem, they leave Jerusalem all by themselves. 
proclaiming basically the same message. The shepherds received. Jerusalem rejected. They had been laughing at those shepherds all these months and years about what they had seen and heard. And so, I have, this didn't take God by surprise. God knew exactly what the reaction of the city would be. And yet He sent these wise men there. Notice something that happens when the wise men show up. It's in verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. That's what happened. It's all that happened. They got worried. Not only Herod, but Scripture says that everyone was disturbed. Everyone was troubled about this news that they had got. How was Herod going to react to it? But nobody leaves to check it out. Nobody steps one step out of the city of Jerusalem to see if any of this was true. Nobody follows these wise men, these magi, to worship. God knew that nobody was going to leave town to check it out. But, He sent them anyway. Now here's why. God sent these wise men to Jerusalem to put Jerusalem on notice. Is that if, if these wise men walk into the city and everywhere they go, they plaster these signs all over the wall, basically saying, take heed, Jerusalem. There's a new king. And things are going to start happening. Changes are going to start taking place. God is going to start moving. And you go from Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 2 and you go through the Gospels and you go into Acts. Bethlehem is forgotten. Nazareth is just a memory. Where does everything happen? Jerusalem. God sent these wise men to that city to let them know God's about to do something. Jesus' ministry and the church's destiny, they all tied to Jerusalem. Jesus takes His message to the city of Jerusalem and preaches it in the temple courts. Jesus dies and He rises again. Where? Jerusalem. The church begins. Go to the book of Acts. The church begins in Jerusalem. In fact, after the church starts in Jerusalem, the church is headquartered in Jerusalem. People go out from the city, but the apostles basically remain in Jerusalem and every once in a while, the reports would come from the different groups of the different missions about what's going on in the name of Jesus Christ, but all of that was headquartered in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where the Passover was celebrated. Jerusalem was where Pentecost took place. Jerusalem was the center of everything that God had in mind for His people took place. So Jerusalem was very important to God. And so as these wise men step into the city, God is saying, Jerusalem, I'm putting you on notice. Things are going to start changing around here. It's going to be different than it's ever been before. There's a new message coming to you. And just as they did when these wise men come, they ignored it and sent them away. They continued to ignore it throughout the ministry. But Jerusalem remained important. In Revelation 3, verse 12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. 
and I will write on him in the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Jerusalem has always been important to God. We've been seeing it in the news just this past couple weeks. And what has happened when it is talk out there about Jerusalem being the capital of Israel? The world goes crazy. And God says, I'm going to be doing something. He did it then. He's doing it now. Hasn't changed one bit. Jerusalem is important. That's why these wise men get there. Because God expected people there to drop everything? No. He knew better. To go to Bethlehem? He knew that wasn't going to happen. He just wanted to put them on notice. Put them on notice that the great prophecy was being fulfilled. That which your prophets had proclaimed to you, it's all coming about. It started. And God would bring it to fruition. The Messiah had been sent. That little tiny baby. The angels go to the shepherds. The wise men go to Jerusalem. The shepherds go out and proclaim, Jerusalem stays at home. Well, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, God presents His message to everyone. God's message goes out to all. It went to those commoners, those shepherds. And the same message did go to the high and mighty. Different reactions in each camp. But each one received it. Each one heard about the Messiah. And what God was doing. The message still remains for all. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's for all mankind. Not just for a select few. Not just for those up in the ivory towers, the political mighty, the religious zealots. It's for everybody. It was for the shepherds. For all mankind. For the Jews. It's for the Gentiles. And we also learn that God doesn't try to impress people. That may be our form of ministry, but it's not God's form. You know, their Christmas season has started started a long time ago. People have been out there shopping. It started way before Black Friday. And you go to many of the markets and you see how they advertise. They advertise to impress. And you'll go out there and there are big displays everywhere. And they've got the end caps full. The very end of the aisle. They've got their best products there. They've got their biggest sellers there. They're trying to impress you. They've got the big ads, the big circulars running in the papers. They want to get you out there. And they're doing a pretty good job. I was out there the other day and it's just bumper to bumper. And that's the way the world does it. They're trying to impress. That's how merchants, that's how they've learned. It's important to package the goods. That's not how God does it. God does not try to impress. You notice again how God packaged Jesus. Born in an obscure town. Placed in a feeding trough in a barn. Worshipped by common shepherds. Ignored by the rich and the powerful. We all would have done it different. But God does it the best. The best way. God's not out to impress us. God knows what you win people with is what you win them to. What you win people with is what you win them to. What is that? It's Jesus. It's that little baby. God didn't want anything getting in the way of His message. 
And that's how that all worked out in Luke and in Matthew. Didn't want anything to come before the very reason He had sent that baby into this world. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's the message. There's only one way. You can build the biggest cathedrals. And they have a tendency to get in the way of the message. And when that happens, they just collapse. We built it bigger and better so many times and it just collapsed because it all gets in the way in the message. And the message is Jesus. Very simple. People will not be saved by a pretty building. They'll not leave their sin because they sat in padded pews. Had air conditioning and heat in the winter. They will not humble themselves before God because they sang some nice songs during the Christmas season. People will only be transformed when they come and they recognize the child, the Savior, Jesus. The story of a baby in a manger sets the stage for everything else that Jesus was about to do in his ministry. It's a message that changes lives. There's a true story about a missionary team that goes to Romania, or not Romania, I'm sorry, Russia. And uh, they had the opportunity when they went to Russia to uh, work in an orphanage. And uh, it was Christmas time. And so what this missionary team did was they got the children together and they shared with them the Christmas story so familiar to us. One elaborate didn't have big manger scenes, none of that. They just sat down with these children and they shared from the Bible the simple message of the shepherds and the wise men and what God had done through this little baby. And after the, the story, they got the children together to do a little craft. They said, what we want you to do, we've, we've got some supplies here, and we want you to build a manger scene. And so the children, they sat there and they, they put together a little stable and they, uh, they made little paper Marys and Joseph and they had the shepherds and the wise men and the missionaries would talk with them as they were working and they, they would remind them of what the story said. And, and one of the missionaries looked and saw something one of the children was doing. Let me share with you the words of this missionary that was written down. We gave the children some materials, instructed them to create the manger and manger scene, and they had just heard about, and all went well until I came to the table of little Misha. He looked to be about six years old and had finished his project. And as I looked at the little boy's manger, I was startled to see not one, but two babies in the manger. So I called a translator to ask why. Looking at his completed manger seed, the child began to repeat the story accurately until he came to the part where Mary put the baby Jesus in the manger. Then Misha started to ad-lib his own ending to the story. He said, and when Mary laid the baby in the manger, Jesus looked at me and asked me if I had a place to stay. I told him I have no mama and papa. So I don't have any place to stay. Then Jesus told me I could stay with him. So I got into the manger. And Jesus looked at me and he told me I could stay with him forever. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about that little baby, Jesus. And His invitation to each and every one of us to crawl in. That we could stay with Him forever. For eternity. Misha had found somebody who would never abandon or abuse Him. Someone who would stay with Him. You see, Jesus became the Son of Man so that we could become the children of God. 
Let's bow in prayer. And Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, our understanding, I hope, is a little bit better as to why you did things the way you did. While we would have done it completely different, you chose to do it in a way that is foreign. You chose to do it in a way that is completely opposite of all logic. You chose to do it your way. And you did it perfectly. I would pray, Heavenly Father, that we would let nothing get in the way of the message. None of the trappings of the season. None of the commercialism. Nothing that we would do, even in the church, would get in the way of the message. The simple message that You sent Your Son into the world to die for the sins of all mankind. That we might have hope, not only now, but that we might have hope for eternity. That we might crawl into the manger and have a home with Jesus. Lord, there may be some here this morning that have never made that decision, who have struggled, who have searched, who have looked for meaning in this life. They have searched and they have found everything wanting. They have been lacking for answers. And I pray that today they would give you the chance to just give their life to you and to see if you will do what you said you would. It's all we ask. I know if we will just do that, You will work in our lives. You have told us that this child You have sent in the world is a gift for each of us. And all we have to do is accept this gift. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't be born into it. But Your Word says if we will accept that gift, You will change our lives. If we will just confess our sins, and dedicate our life to You each day. Everything will be different. Now, and for eternity. We'll still face struggles. We'll still face trials. We'll still face the circumstances of sin. But You have told us You will never leave us or forsake us. You will walk with us every step of the way. No matter what it is we face. So Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning we would give the most precious gift You could receive ourselves. And that we would receive the most precious gift You could ever give Your Son. And we will just praise You and glorify You for what You have done and will continue to do. In the name of Jesus. And we pray this in His name. Amen.